If you have your Bible or your Bible app, why don't you open it up to Psalm 80, Psalm 80, 80. You see, Americans, and I don't know if you're an American, but I am, and Americans here, we live in a culture, a culture that struggles to make peace for feelings that could be defined as negative. Did you know that few employers actually offer bereavement leave? When somebody has died and a family member, they need some time off, and they restrict it to specific family members in a certain amount of time, a small amount of time, were pushed and encouraged to rush past emotions and like anger, fear, sadness, and grief. Well, perhaps that's the reason that many of us believe God is too busy or unwilling to hear our negative emotions. He doesn't have time for that. Maybe it's because society indicates that these emotions should be ignored or shoved down deep inside, repressed, hurried through. And so we begin to feel that we can't be angry at God for these things. Maybe we worry about the repercussions if we were to express those feelings fully. But here we are on the first Sunday of Advent, and we're ready to talk about light. That's right, light. Our homes, our Advent candles, Christmas trees full of twinkly lights and uh, maybe warm spices. Maybe you're cooking some cook bacon, some cookies, those types of things. And we're anticipating for the season uh, of excitement. And then we come to this book of Psalms and this chapter, Amy. And we see that this particular psalm is what's known as a lament. It's filled with grief with anger, sadness, and despair. And not only that, but those difficult feelings are directed toward God. Now, darkness and light, lament and hope, those are actually more uh, related than we sometimes like to admit. We can't appreciate one without acknowledging and understanding the other. So let's get into God's word today. Again, if you have your Bible, Psalm 80, let's read. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might. Come and save us. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. O oh Lord Almighty, how long will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us a source of contention to our neighbors, and our enemies mock us. Restore us, O oh God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt and drove out the nations and, pl and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its boughs to the sea and shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and the creatures of the field feed on it. Return to us, O God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down. It is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand. The Son of Man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us, that we may be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's talk about lament. Lament. Lament is to be honest, is to be honest. Naming reality of, is the start of lament. 
when a doctor, let's just say you were at a doctor's appointment and you want the true facts from them, uh, perhaps they come in with some really bad news. Your loved one has died. They have to say died or die. They cannot use an, uh, a, a euphemism because they have to be very clear. People won't understand their interpretation. They will misinterpret that meaning. So doctors have to say the technical words, your loved one has died. Not they've gone off to, to better places. And so when we lament, we're honest, we have to name the reality, we have to be true about what we're talking about. Naming the reality is important for those experiencing loss, grief, or trauma. Uh, there's this expression, it's, it's very popular right now, people will joke about doing it, um, perhaps they'll uh, accuse other people of doing this. The term is gaslighting. I don't know if you've heard of this before, um, but it's used to describe when someone's reality is denied by someone else, causing that person to question their own reality, their own sanity, if you will. Sometimes saying things like, oh, it wasn't that bad, or failing to live, believe somebody's lived experience can cause them to question themselves. Did that even really happen? Am I really feeling this way? Should I really feel this way? I mean, maybe you're having a hard time applying this. I still do. Uh, but let's just put it in context. You come from home from work and you tell your family member that you had a really bad day. You describe it in detail. And instead of listening to you and maybe comforting you, they actually question whether it was actually that bad or did that even really happen? Can you imagine how hurtful that must feel? That is gaslighting. Now, I don't believe that most people do this intentionally. I believe these folks, especially if they're loving friends and families that you, family members that you will actually share that information with and confide in, that when they do this, I don't think they're intentionally trying to drive you crazy, or make you question your reality, but they just want to give you some perspective. But in that moment, actually, you probably don't want perspective. You just want to share. You just want that information to be out there. So a good question when someone brings that to you, if you uh, have somebody saying, telling all about their bad day, you can ask them this simple question that will help you not to gaslight them. Do you want me to offer some advice in fixing that problem? Or do you want me to just listen to you? This is a healthy and practical way to be thoughtful and loving instead of gaslighting so that you can just move on with your day and fix their problem. So it's important to be honest and name that trauma because otherwise people will question whether or not it even happened. When we name our painful reality, like we saw here in the Psalms, we're able to process and cope with it in ways that can't be ignored. Uh, anxiety and the consequences of anxiety increase when we can't name the reality that's going on inside of us. Uh, this is something that we may have experienced in big or small ways, uh, but suppressing, stuffing down those emotions only works for so long. It turns into consequences on our physical health, our, our explosions of anger. I know for guys, we really get angry. It's, we don't feel like we're comfortable being sad. So we get angry and we, we lash out at the people that we love, or we burn out whatever it is that we're doing we just burn out and we lose all excitement or joy or whatever it is because we have suppressed emotions instead of dealt with them. Coping with, with the, and processing reality is why counseling, psychotherapy, those types of things are very helpful. It acknowledges, uh, by acknowledging and speaking, reality helps you move toward healing. Well, naming reality is important for those who are listening. So it's not just the person who's dealing with it um, firsthand, but also those around them, because they may have a shared experience. They may also be going through it, but never felt like they could say it, never felt like they could share that issue. And 
it's not just me. I thought I was the only one. Are the thoughts that would come into their minds when they hear somebody else share their problem and name that reality. Name that tough day, that family member uh, whom they just don't get along with or connect with. Now, it's difficult to address a need when no one knows it's there too. So there is some responsibility on the person who is dealing with, a, with the, the issue, right? If you don't share it, no one can be there for you. And then we kind of close ourselves off to ever helping anyone. We, we don't empathize with anybody after that part. And we'll get into that here in a moment. But if things are too painful and you don't feel safe that you can't actually connect with another person, no one will connect with you. And that's really kind of a, try, a, a challenging thing. And so we'll look at some solutions to that on both sides of this as we go through today. But uh, I want to move on to something uh, interesting I didn't know. But lament, let's talk about lament again for a second, because lament is actually 70% of the Psalms. So when you flip through the 150 chapters in the book of Psalms, and this was their song book, hence the name, 70% of them are laments. But less than today, by comparison, are less than 50% of modern worship music is lament or in general, lamentatious, if you will. <laughs> and I really think that this makes sense because we, we have moved towards a, a, a thought process and a, a general feeling where we don't like to feel uncomfortable. Uh, how many of us want to cry out in a worship service about all their sad things that are going on? No, let's, let's suppress those, let's put those away. But no, this is the place where it's supposed to be safe and welcoming to lament. That's what they did in Psalms, and we'll point to that here in a moment. But today, it's about getting excited and happy and joyous. Those are great and have their place, but far too few are in touch with the reality that there are things to lament. And we must do that in order to point to the light. It gives us, uh, when we don't lament, it gives us a false understanding of God. Uh, the God who we worship, does he not care about our feelings and emotions? We, he must not. That's why I have to stuff them down. That's why I can't sing out and cry out about them. And when we neglect that lament, we create a community that struggles to embrace people for who they are and what they're going through. Uh, if you've had a visitor at your church, we've had some at ours, that, that it's hard to connect with. Are we not being in an open mindset to connect with that person because we're neglecting lament? We're neglecting the sadness and brokenness of this world. We just want to push through and enjoy us in happy days kind of thing. Think about that. Now, lament is normalized here in the Psalms. It's part of living in a broken world. The majority of Psalms are laments, which shows us that it's not just minor experiences. Difficult feelings are part of the human experience. We all have them. Difficult feelings are part of the faith experience too. It's not just all um, hearts and flowers as after you say yes to Jesus. It's challenging, and that's why we need each other to build each other up and support one another. But how do we support somebody who's not willing to share these hurtful and confused, frustrated feelings? And there's, there's this tension between that, and we're trying to address it here today. You see, some of our difficult experiences are not just personal, just me, but they're communal. So like we said before, what you share can actually be somebody else's thoughts and feelings that they didn't feel comfortable to address. And so the healing can happen in community, not just as an individual. You see, lament is not something to be avoided, but to be embraced. Additional, uh, in addition to the vast number of songs that lament, there's also an entire book, I don't know if you've read it before, 
called Lamentations. Lament is part of what it means to follow God. But let's talk about Psalm 80, because that's, that's our main book for today, right? Psalm 80 is not just any old lament. It's a lament that is directed at God. You see, the people in this lament are blaming God for their terrible situation. I want to read once again just a few of these verses, verses 5, 6, and 12. You have fed them the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us an object of derision, and our neighbors, our enemies, our, and our enemies mock us. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? And you might be thinking, and maybe you've thought this before when people uh, cry out in frustration toward God, how dare you blame God? That's not right. He's holy. You shouldn't, you shouldn't blame him. That's like questioning him. It is questioning him, you might think. Many times our feelings and emotions are just that. They're not right. But in this given situation, this is how they felt. This is what they believed. God is all-powerful. Therefore, he's the one to blame for all this. He's the one pulling the strings. The words leave their lips, and their confession of this belief is cemented in history, in Scripture. They blamed God for the stuff going on in their lives. That's what they believed. Though they blame Him, the reality is that we all live in the consequences of our own actions. God, why didn't you tell me to slow down And I, because I was speeding? Why didn't you tell me to slow down? Now I've got a speeding ticket. Someone might also think and wonder to themselves and be mad at God if they even believe in God at all. After they find out, they got the test, that they contracted an STD, and think, well, if God is really good or if he's real, why didn't he protect me, they wonder. These are the folks living in the consequences of their actions. And we all live in the consequences of our actions. Not just these extreme examples, but the way that we treat one another on a daily basis, the way we cause division or unity between believers, between neighbors, between family members, consequences. But let's get back to the psalmist and those who would join that same voice sing this song before God. Even though they blamed God for their situation, they still affirm and believe that God is trustworthy, loving, and good. They call out to God to restore them with the expectation that God will hear them and respond. See, verses 8 and 11 show us that they acknowledged God's past faithfulness, and plead for that goodness to be replicated, demonstrating their trust that if God cared for them then, God will care for them now as well. Lament is rooted, as we see right there, it's rooted in hope. They addressed God because they believed God would listen and respond. They are not afraid of God's response. They long for it because they hope it will be salvific, dealing with salvation, right? And that it will be a loving response. It will redeem them. Advent. Advent is a season of intermingled lament and hope. Perhaps at this time, it's not a very happy time for you. You remember a loved one who's not here anymore. You remember the relationships that you don't have anymore. You lament in your heart, but maybe not out loud, the broken relationships that you still mill over on a daily basis. But lament and hope are divinely interconnected here. You see, the cry of every longing heart is to be saved. 
We read of people who long for the Messiah to come. That's what we're reading about. It's like the prequel, if you will. Throughout the years of silence and oppression, they want a savior. There is a lament in this waiting. And they ask, where is God? What is he doing? Has he forgotten us? But there is hope in the midst of longing too. The people are looking, watching, waiting, and their expectation that God will hear their prayers and respond. And we see this in the lives of faithful followers of God. People like Anna and Simeon who got to see Jesus, baby Jesus, and knew this was the Savior. Of course, Mary and Joseph, and even the Magi watching the skies, they were longing and preparing and looking for the Savior. Lament is not the opposite of hope. Lament is not the opposite of hope. Taking time to lament opens us up to the possibilities of hoping and trusting in the faithfulness of God. God will be present with us, Emmanuel, and will be free, and we will be free from sin, and we will be saved. Laments made in hope open us up to healthy and whole community with one another. And lament moves us into hope that is built on truth and the faithfulness of God. As we wrap up today, uh, thank you for joining us on this, but I want to say just a few more things about lament. Because I don't want to rush past it, because it seems like it's easy to do that, to disregard the vast number of psalms that are lament psalms, to rush to the happy parts of the stories. That would be to miss the beauty in the midst of the grief. There is hope, even in lament. Lament helps us remember that God is big enough for the entire human experience, even the hard parts. Lament helps us remember that God has been faithful and will be again. Lament helps us remember that we are better, healthier, and more whole when we tell the truth before God and before one another. As we lament, we are open to confession, to repentance, to the beauty of resurrection life in the midst of all of it. And as we reflect on this Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, we remember that Christ came to be the light of the world. But we also hold closely to a God who continues to come, who continues to show up and loves us in the midst of our pain, our grief, our loss and trauma. And we long for that Christ to show up again, to meet our deepest needs and heal our deepest wounds. And as we sing our laments and confidence that we have confidence that he hears us and he will come again. And the one who has sat in the darkness of lament can truly understand and appreciate the light. As we conclude this little time together, I want to thank you for watching all the way to the end. I want, to, want you to know that I'm praying for you, and uh, this moment here is a time of prayer. And uh, I, I want to conclude this time together, but if you have a prayer request, I hope that you would share it with us online. If you would send me a message, or you can a comment online here. Um, I would love to pray for you and with you about that. Uh, we have a, a large list. We have sick folks, of course. We have hurting people. We have warring nations. We have a community that's fractured by spiritualism and humanism and atheism and Christian communities that are putting social agendas before biblical truths. And we pray together that in the midst of those things we lament, we cry out because we know he is the only one that can do anything about it. We have faith in him and his faithfulness. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, 
thank you. Thank you for being our Lord, our Savior. And Lord, we lament the brokenness of our world, our particular situations, today even the sickness that has gone through not only our congregation, but others in our community as well. And we ask that you would hold up and repair and restore these physical bodies that are aching and that are ailing right now, Jesus. We lament that brokenness and that pain. We cry out to you knowing that you can, as the great physician, fix and heal those things. We call on you knowing you are faithful and true. We pray, Lord, that you would restore our community to wholeness in you, not in some misguided attempt that humans can right their own wrongs apart from Christ. Though I pray that we would be a light in this community for the authority of your word and how it actually can be lived out by people. We pray that you would restore this world on earth as it is in heaven. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. God bless and Merry Christmas.